they sustain us, they give us meaning, and they have the power to propel us to take action. As public health practitioners, we learn early on the importance of storytelling in our work. Good stories inspire us all, which in turn inspires change. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Williams, Dean of the Faculty here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third program in our Public Health Storytellers series, When Words Change Lives. A conversation with award-winning ProPublica journalist, Lizzie Presser. Rare is a writer like Lizzie, who when she puts her pen to paper, or rather fingers to keyboard, impacts not only her subjects, but decision makers and readers as well. From her George Polk award-winning piece on black land seizure, to her moving gut-wrenching reporting on why black diabetics lose their limbs at triple the rates of others, Lizzie exposes long-standing yet often invisible injustices, systemic flaws and fractures in our society. Her words compel us to keep our gaze on the outcomes that result from these systemic flaws. They also propel us, compel us to keep our gaze on those fractures in our policies, practices, and systems. Public health is indebted to storytellers like Lizzie, who bring health, wealth, and racial disparities to the fore. Storytellers who help us see the human face of the myriad of crises and challenges we confront. Her words have forced us to confront and reckon with the dark truth of our history that has been buried for far too long. Her words have prompted lawmakers to enact meaningful reform. Put simply, her words have changed lives. For those of you who don't think the written word can have such a profound effect, listen to what another author and commentator, Heather McGee, recently said. Everything we believe comes from a story we've been told. If that's a bad story, then that is a world we'll get. Lizzie's stories give readers the tools to find the truth and make change, turning that bad story into one of hope and triumph. While we celebrate and listen to Lizzie today, I would be remiss if we didn't also acknowledge and celebrate our moderator, New York Times columnist, Nicholas Kristof, who for decades has written poignant, provocative stories that have also changed lives. I thank you both Lizzie and Nick for joining us for today's incredibly important conversation. And with that, I hand it off to you, Nick. Thank you so much, Dean Williams. Um, and I've got to say, this is thrilling for me because I've known Lizzie uh, forever. Uh, Lizzie, as it happens, was the researcher for a book that uh, my wife, Cheryl Boudin, and I wrote um, a number of years ago called A Path Appears. And Lizzie was, you know, fantastic in that effort. And we traveled together to Chicago to look at the uh, efforts in inner cities to use an epidemiological model to tackle uh, violence. And, um, and, you know, in the journalism world, in terms of covering public health, there, uh, there are a lot of folks who go astray in one way or another. Some aren't great writers. Some uh, use anecdotes, you know, and sort of see the think that the plural of anecdote is trend. Um, and others, uh, uh, conversely, are so rooted in data that they don't don't humanize the stories in ways that will uh, will 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 really move people. And Lizzie has the trifecta: brilliant writer, great user of anecdote, but always rooted in 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 in, in real data and and evidence. And uh, so thrilled to uh, have this conversation with her. I want to uh, mention that those of you who are watching, please, uh, please grill Lizzie. Uh, send in your questions to facebook.com/slash Harvard Public Health. Again, that's facebook.com/slash 
Harvard Public Health and um, uh, and uh, uh, you know welcome uh, tough questions for Lizzie. Um, <laughs> Lizzie, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. And thank you to the Harvard School of Public Health for doing this. Welcome, Lizzie. Thank you so much, Nick. I'm so happy to be here and so happy you're moderating. And, and thank you to, to Dean Williams for inviting me and for that very generous introduction. Well, um, now, way back when, you were um, deeply interested in public policy and storytelling about public policy. But it wasn't obvious to me that you were really focused on public health. How did that come about? Um, I didn't set out to focus on public health, to be quite honest. I did, after I worked with you on your book, went and I got a degree in public policy. And after that, I started to write my own investigations. And I was really a generalist at first. I wrote about um, the exploitation of Filipino cruise ship workers. I wrote about kids who had been absorbed into the foster care system after their parents were deported. I wrote about an underground abortion network. And when I got to ProPublica, my editors looked at my body of work and they noticed that there was this common thread of healthcare. And to be quite frank, I hadn't fully seen that thread, but once they pointed it out, it became quite clear to me that of course, yes, this is the thread in these stories that I have written. And I say that because um, I guess I think that for most people who are living around the poverty line in America in access to healthcare is such a common experience and it has enormous implications for how they're able to live their lives. And so I had been taking it on kind of sideways in my stories and my editors at ProPublica asked me to take health on as a beat. And I realized that this was an opportunity to put the healthcare system in focus and to really drill down on where the healthcare system was failing so many Americans. Um. Lizzie, I so much admire you for taking on this on as a beat, but one of the challenges is that it's a hard beat to get a lot of eyeballs into. And, um, you know, I know, and in my case, I write about uh, population health and it's something that affects zillions of people and readership plummets, you know, compared to if you write about, you know, one one puppy somewhere that's uh, ca caught in a well. And I, uh, the, one of the problems is that we tend to preach to the choir. And frankly, preaching to the Harvard School of Public Health is kind of the choir. These are folks who believe in public health. But what I'm, I'm curious what lessons you've learned, because you've done this very, very ably. How do we engage in storytelling to preach beyond the choir, to galvanize people who frankly don't care about public health and aren't entirely sure what it is? Yeah, I think it's a really good question and one I struggled with when I started this beat. Um, when I started the year of 2020, uh, my editor and I decided that I should take a disease and use that as a lens through which to look at the problems in the healthcare system in America. And I wanted to find a disease that was both extraordinarily prevalent um, and also potentially deadly, right? And so I think part of the problem with talking about public health is that so much of the work of public health is in preventing complications. And that's not sexy. It's not interesting often as a story. Um, and diabetes is, you know, for many Americans, um, kind of a mundane, uh, it's a, you can live with diabetes without complications right now because of all the advancements in, in um, medical care for diabetics. Uh, what I was seeing though, when I looked deeper into diabetes and its complications was that complications were on the rise. And there's no good reason for that. Right. If we're seeing the advancements that we're seeing in terms of medicines and technologies for diabetics, and we really are, if we're seeing complications rise, it means that those advancements aren't reaching the people who need them most. And, and I guess your, to your point about um, how to make people care, I do look sometimes at extreme harm, right? So what is the worst case scenario for someone who has diabetes? And when I started to look into the literature, amputations was the first thing that popped up at me. And there had been a 50% increase in amputations. I think it was, yeah, in, in the last several years, which is, there, there is no excuse for that kind of an increase, right? And then not only had there been this increase, but there has been this long standing disparity. And if you are black in this country, you're at least three times as likely to suffer an amputation than anyone else, right? Again, there's no excuse for that. So it felt like I had these two areas where I wanted to dig in and understand how is this happening, right? What, what are the systems that are designed to create these outcomes and how do we solve that? 
I want to come back to the amputation story in a little bit because it's just so powerful and so well done. Um, that's an example where you were where you very powerfully were able to put a human face on a problem or a number of human faces on a on a problem. Uh, and likewise, I found that that is a way to leverage to get people interested. I think the hardest problems with covering public health are those where you cannot put a single public face on a problem. I've, um, you know, I believe deeply that micronutrients are one of the interventions that get some of the high, greatest bang for the buck uh, worldwide. And yet it is really hard to tell an engaging story about a kid getting vitamin A supplements. And so how, wow. so just to follow up on that, I mean, how do we, how do we tell important story? Well, vaccination is another, you know, it's very hard to show with any one child that gets vaccinated. Uh, so so how, how do we, you know, how, how do we cover those public health stories that don't, aren't so easy to put a human face on? Yeah, I mean, I do think this is this is a huge question for the entire field and for um, for my field, journalists who report on public health. And I think every story in my mind demands a different storytelling structure, right? So when you're talking about um, issues that are more difficult to see from an individual's perspective, right? I think often there's a way to kind of widen that lens and to see a problem as an epidemic. So, and I actually did think about this for amputations as well. I, I almost started this story looking at um, uh, a patient's experience and just following one patient. And when I met Dr. Fakarede, who's a doctor who I follow in this story, I realized that what he had was a window into the ubiquity of the problem, right? And that in and of itself helps a public understand that this isn't this isn't an isolated story, right? And that there are, there's a wide array of experience um, and there are a number of people in, in Mississippi Delta, way too many people who are suffering from a problem like amputations and for different reasons, although there is, there is much overlap. And so I find that for that story in particular and for other stories, I'm looking for an avenue to help the reader see either the emotional impact on one person or kind of the broad impact on a community. One of the your stories that uh, I thought was just immensely powerful, uh, I and mean, there, you know, there have been many, but uh, it was the story about uh, black land seizures. And uh, you wrote that for ProPublica, but also the New Yorker. And I think a lot of people completely were unaware of this. Uh, uh, is a multi-generational black family in the South uh, whose land had been stolen from them uh, through uh, various Jim Crow kinds of, of laws. Um, can you tell, uh, share with us a little bit about, about that story and, and how it came to, how you made it turn, you know, brought it to life? Sure, so I, um, I came to that story through a statistic, right? So I, a friend had shared with me an article that, um, it included a line that only 1% of American farmers were black. And that struck me as totally strange. I'm like, well, how could this possibly be? And I knew about USDA discrimination against black farmers, um, but I didn't think that that told the entire story. And so I dove into the academic literature and I found this very small corner of literature that looked at this concept of heirs property, which became the subject of this article I wrote. And heirs property is land that's passed down without a will from generation to generation. And in the 20th century, there was very good reason to be um, skeptical uh, uh, and suspicious of white supremacist courts if you were a black landowner, particularly in the South. And so there was very good reason not to be registering a will. But the result of that is that today and for generations really throughout the entire half, second half of the 20th century, um, black landowners in the South, if they have heirs property, have a very tenuous form of ownership and it can be stolen through these legal loopholes uh, because the legal system is not designed to protect land that is in heirs property. And I wanted to tell that story and to look at the mechanics of how that land can be taken from, from the landowners. But I also um, was really interested in the emotional toll of that. And I wanted to look at what it felt like for a family to be dispossessed of that land, to lose some connection to their identity to their ancestry, to their home, to history. Uh, and so I was kind of taking it on in that two-pronged way, right? How do I tell a story about the mechanics and, um, and the emotional toll? And I found this fantastic family um, 
in North Carolina named the Reels family who had um, been dispossessed of their land uh, decades ago and had refused to leave because they felt so strongly, first of all, just attached to the property. It was their land, it was the land that their great grandfather had bought one generation after slavery and they had farmed it and they had learned to work the water and they had built their livelihood on that land. But also they believed that that land was morally theirs, even if legally it now belonged to a developer. And so they refused to leave the land to the point that they were actually two of the brothers, uh, Melvin and LaCurtis, were uh, imprisoned for civil contempt. And they were um, left in a county jail, locked up in a county jail for eight years. They became two of the longest serving inmates for civil contempt in the country. And so they were so attached to that property that they felt compelled to sacrifice their liberty before walking off it. And so that's what I, I knew I, I wanted to tell their story to try to get at what it was about that attachment to the property and their moral sense of justice, right? That was going to you know, lead them to fight this fight even though the law was against them. I think some folks would see that story and say, this is a extraordinary story of uh, racial inequity. It's a remarkable story about the roots of inequality in America writ large, but they wouldn't immediately see it as a public health story. So why is that a public health story? I didn't address it as a public health story initially. Um, and I think that the way in which you can think about it as one, I think there are several ways you can think about it as one. Um, first of all, when you are dispossessing families of their wealth, um, you are removing their ability to make healthy decisions in their lives often, whether that's in terms of access to housing, uh, access to exercise, access to health insurance in this country, which is insane, access to the doctors they need to see. Um, you know, I one of the things that I was looking at in that story, or one of the kind of driving questions was that Black Americans in this country had lost 90% of their farmland in much of the 20th century, right? So it's an enormous amount of wealth. And it wasn't just that this land was dispossessed, but because of heirs' property, they couldn't access loans, um, they couldn't access HUD grants, so they weren't able to maintain the wealth of their property. And when you lose that access, you lose so much in terms of health in this country. I think for the reels in particular, um, you know, they they had built a business fishing in the waterfront that their land abutted, and Melvin was a, a very successful shrimper. He was one of the most successful shrimpers in the area. And that didn't just mean money, but it meant that they were eating fresh fish all the time. And so they also lost access to the natural resources that are part of that land. And that that was something that I heard from families across the Carolinas when I was doing this research. It, I wasn't just focused on the Reels family, but I spoke to, I looked into um, three dozen cases in this, in this story. I'm uh, speaking to you right now from the family farm in Oregon. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm struck that a lot of people around here um, think that the their prosperity in, in rural Oregon is because of the, you know, the extraordinary uh, courage and perseverance and uh, diligence of their uh, ancestors. And you know, to some degree, it genuinely was. But, you know, it was also, of course, because of a program for disadvantaged whites, which was the Homestead Act. And any pioneer who got out to Oregon, uh, any white pioneer who got out here, uh, got 640 acres. Um, in other parts of the country, 160. And an awful lot of um, uh, wealth uh, here is has its roots in that program, but it was one that was denied to African-Americans and, and, and other people of color and often was land, you know, stolen from native communities. Uh, and um, it, uh, you know, it's a, it completely goes to your point about the the roots of, of inequity and the degree to which they drive public health consequences. Um, I want to bring in um, uh, Neiman Fellow and uh, journalist uh, John Archibald, and uh, he's got a question for you regarding that uh, that article about black land seizures. As far as the land seizures are concerned, um, you've done a good job of talking about individuals. Um, as, aside from the individuals. What has this done to these communities? So it's done a lot to these communities. I mean, I think just going back to 
every time land is taken, it has a ripple effect across a community. And with the Reels family, I could see that quite clearly. So one thing is that during the Jim Crow laws, the Reels owned and operated the only black owned beach in the county. Um, and that meant that this was the only place where black people from the area felt safe, they would tell me, just letting their guard down. And even when I was there in February 2018, I would see families driving up down the street, catching a glimpse of the beach and coming back because they could no longer walk on it, right? So there is a sense of leisure that was also an historical attachment to this kind of leisure that was lost. Um, Melvin and LaCurtis had also, also built this kind of micro economy on the land. And so they had brought in people from all over the area and taught them how to work the water. And so these are people who were historically in retail jobs or service industry, and they would bring them out onto the boats and show them how to crab and shrimp and fish and turn them into businessmen. Um, and so there was a way in which they were also building wealth, not just for themselves, but helping people around them build wealth on their own terms as well. Um, and again, this is a kind of story that I would hear, not just from the Reels family, but from others, that there was a sense of community and a sense of unity that could be found on these properties that was gone. I mean, there's, and then on top of that, if you just think about the Southeast region, right, and the wealth that is in that land, part of the problem is that so many people with heirs property can't access the wealth that they still have in that land because of these laws that make it so difficult for them to get funding to maintain the property, right? So if you were able to clear those titles, you would release so much wealth into the South that right now is just very difficult to access. Um, you know, I think there's a recognition that that's an issue in Lesotho. I don't think there's a recognition that's a real issue here in the, you know, right here. Um, and it's funny, the U.S. is doing a great deal to encourage, you know, the title issues in other countries, but uh, but but it's neglected at home. Um, you alluded to the issue of um, of amputations and particularly in African American communities related to diabetes, and I found that such a powerful piece because I think that you know, Americans understand that there are consequences of racial inequity in terms of housing, in terms of jobs, you know, maybe even life expectancy. But the idea that one is disproportionately likely to lose a leg, um, that was, I think, surprising to many and, and, and really striking. So um, how did that, how did that come about? And, you know, what were your thoughts as you were reporting on this? Yeah, it's interesting, Nick, because even when I was reading kind of public health literature, um, it was I would always see these kind of remarks, right? That uh, that amputation disproportionately affected black patients, and I, I it just startled me that it would be something that we would talk about almost as a fact of life, which kind of is how it's sometimes framed in public health literature. I read, um, and that I hadn't ha had any way to kind of understand why this had come to be. Um, so I felt very compelled upon reading the statistics to figure out how that system had been designed to exclude black patients from the care that they needed. Uh, I, um, I generally take a story that has national scope and try to find a local place where I can tell a more personal story. And so I looked at Mississippi, which is has one of the worst um, outcomes in terms of disparities in amputations. And I was looking at South Carolina as well. And I uh, stumbled across a few blog posts from a doctor named Felucio Facarede. And he had written about amputations in these blog posts as a moral injustice. And I was kind of stunned at the boldness of his language. Um, not many doctors write with that kind of boldness. And so I decided to um, try to reach out to him and see if he would talk to me about his work. He had moved to the Delta to try to reduce amputations and he was achieving that. And he uh, would not take my calls. He had somehow told everyone in his office to hang up on me when I called. I think they thought that I was investigating him. <laughs> so, so, um, so I ended up flying to Mississippi and I wrote him an email when I got there and I said, I'd, I'd like to come meet you. I'm in Mississippi, I will be there in a few hours. And he finally responded. And he said, uh, I'll see you at 6 p.m. in my office. 
And so that that's how it began. And um, and I think, uh, although Dr. Fakhariti can say for himself, but I believe that it was kind of going there and saying to him, look, I'm not here to parachute in and parachute out. I'm not here to write a two-day story. I want to watch you work for a month. I want to see what it's like to be you and what you see. Um, and, and, and I think that was the point when he started to take me more seriously. Um, and uh, Dr. Fakarede, you were here. Uh, thank you for, uh, in the end, uh, <laughs> cooperating with Lizzie for that truly amazing piece. But no, but even more than that, just thank you for what you're doing day in and day out, uh, saving, uh, saving people's limbs and lives. I, um, you're on the front line. Uh, Lizzie and I bounce in, bounce out of places. You are, you are there. Uh, so uh, when you saw, well, what was going through your mind when you got this, <laughs> these calls from Lizzie and, and, and when you saw the actual piece? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Nick. And um, hello, Lizzie. I, um, first of all, honored to, uh, to join uh, this great session uh, hosted uh, by uh, the Harvard School of Public Health. And thank you to all the organizers and uh, hello to the audience. Um, so interestingly enough, um, my background is, you know, I did a lot of my, my, my schooling up in the Northeast and um, having, uh, having been in the South uh, since 2015, um, you tend to understand not only um, the clinical, economical, but the human impact of some of the disease states that we treat as cardiovascular and limb salvage specialist, um, diabetes and obesity, I call it the diabetes epidemic being, being, being at the forefront um, of the public health challenge and why we still have a wide gap when you look at the life expectancy of black Americans in rural areas versus um, urban areas. And um, that has still, that gap has still, has, has not been marginally closed for decades, in spite of all the advancements in technologies and in, 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 in devices and medicines. And you wonder why. So when I got there, it's understanding the strengths and the weaknesses of not only your community, but also to ward off those who are just coming in to write one or two day stories and publicizing it as if that is the gospel. And what I mean by that is, you know, the story that you just mentioned um, about um, uh, those two gentlemen in South Carolina. That is part of the issues that we call social determinants of health. How did policies affect uh, not only housing uh, outcomes, transportation outcomes, but economic instability in these communities, therefore affecting their educational and health literacy outcomes, and therefore affecting their health outcomes when it comes to understanding not only the disease states, like diabetes and how it leads to poor numbness and tingling in your limbs and you have this thing called neuropathy. And if you have lack of sensation in your, in your, your feet and you step on, on a toe uh, or you stub your toe, um, that could lead to um, that poor circulation that has not been diagnosed by your primary care physician evolving into a non-healing wound and ulcer. And the first recommendation by primary care docs or surgeons is to cut it off. I mean, the fact that medicine had progressed to the state where we have dehumanized it and there's this lack of, you know, this indifference uh, in, 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 in the outcomes of a race or a group. And we see that as normalizing, normalizing the process and accepting that as just standard of care. Let's take off a toe, take off another toe and take off um, the entire limb not understanding the consequences that 80% of these patients will be dead within five years, understanding that it costs a family that makes $35,000 a year, over $150,000 to take care of an amputee in that year, 90% of whom will suffer from chronic pain, 40% of whom will have chronic depression, um, and the contralateral leg will also be amputated within two to three years. And so putting that together and, and, and telling the story, um, it was fascinating to find someone like Lizzie just call you and say, well, listen, I want to come and understand how this happened. Usually I get calls that, you know, I just want to write a story about you. Well, I, it, it wasn't about me. I, I didn't want the story to be about me. 
I wanted the story to be about the community and how come we have policies in place that just don't reflect, um, you know, African Americans when it comes to trials, trials that policies emanate from, <laughs> right? Um, data, there's lack of data when it comes to, if you think about all clinical trials to date in the cardiovascular space, less than 5% of African Americans have been included. And we make up 15%. Maybe Hispanics, less than 1%. Women, 33%. And we so why, have all. Felicia, <laughs> why did you why did you let me come into your practice? Well, why I allowed her to come to the practice is because she eventually, basically said that you know, listen, I need to come here and understand why amputations occur. And I said, well, only if you are willing to stay here for weeks and observe how the process starts, not only from the clinic, but also to the hospital and then to the community to see how it's tied in and to bring in po how the policy affects every level of every decision making or indecisions that are being made. And um, she showed up just like a New Yorker, <laughs> showed up um, and said, yes, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and, and learn. And, and that's why, that's why I allowed her to, to come in. It's interesting because I think this is a really difficult thing for some journalists because of HIPAA laws. And so it's, it's, um, I, I was also quite grateful to Dr. Fakarede for allowing me um, to, to witness what he did with patient consent and, and with HIPAA all dealt with. Um, but it's, it's not an easy thing to negotiate as a journalist. And so it's really important to find doctors like Dr. Fakarede who are, who are willing to kind of um, you know, move through the bureaucracy of that kind of a question and to allow witnesses, right? People who can report on what they are seeing every day. Well, I want to come back to that that question about the obstacles and you know HIPAA laws and also just whether there is a business model for this kind of of, of journalism. But I want to bring in at this point uh, Dr. Mary Bassett, uh, uh, former uh, NYC uh, health commissioner and uh, the FXB professor of the practice of health and human rights. Uh, and so, Dr. Bassett, um, I'm. I know this inequity goes way back. Is mm. is there? Are we making progress? And are there? Does this kind of coverage? Does the stories like this? Do they actually make a difference? Well, it's been really such a pleasure to listen to this very rich conversation, and I, and I want to salute you, Dr. Fakoretti, for. Uh, taking the very unusual step of relocating to the Mississippi Delta, which is probably, you know, equivalent to many underdeveloped countries in, um, in its resources and its issues. Uh, as Lizzie said, you know, these disparities, as we describe them now, the, the gap in health and life itself between the population of African descent has been around even before this country was formally founded. And it's been so long standing that it seems almost normal and not interesting. Um, and that's, that's the real challenge to, uh, you know, to raise up the moral outrage that Dr. Fakaretti has expressed um, is something that the kind of journalism that Lizzie's done achieves because it combines um, the story of individuals and takes us beyond what the usual explanation will be, is that these were people who were lazy, who didn't bother to go to the doctor, or if they went, they didn't bother to follow advice, they eat too much, they don't exercise enough. The kind of explanation that puts a problem with the people and explains the context of people's lives. And that's why you had to stay there <laughs> for a month and helps the reader see what we uh, have been describing in, in recent years as structural racism, that this is related to history, it's related to disadvantage that is historically rooted, economically entrenched, and, and, and based on, on a, a U.S. racial hierarchy. Now, have things gotten better? Well, yes, they have. Uh, life expectancy has improved for all groups, uh, at least until very recently. Uh, and uh, of course, um, that has not gotten rid of the relative gap. 
uh, and it has not helped us address preventable um, outcomes like like uh, extremity amputations. But to understand them, you've got to, you know, why is there so much overweight? Why is there so much diabetes? Why aren't health services available? Uh, when they are, why aren't they of higher quality? What's happening with the entrance of for-profit, profit-making enterprises into uh, even rural areas? And, and why is it so hard for people to follow this advice? So these are complex uh, issues. Um, and they're ones that it's a rare journalist who has the opportunity to really display them. But that's what we're up against. And if we want to get rid of these gaps, uh, we have to talk more about patient edu than patient education. But um, I still wonder, frankly, and don't, don't, don't tell my editors this, but you know, to what extent this kind of coverage Mm. actually moves the needle because, you know, Mississippi leaders, they are certainly aware of these inequities. Um, congressional Republicans who are the obstacle to expanding medical coverage, uh, to providing other more equitable interventions, they are aware of these. And I think, you know, when they see articles like this, they tend to immediately tune them out. And uh, I think we're seeing the needle move, whether it's all related are. to great journalism like Lizzie's. But I, and I do want to take a moment to give a shout out. We have had this whole conversation without mentioning COVID, which is pretty amazing, <laughs> but um, which in many ways displayed all the same things that we're talking about now. And I think that all of us in public health and in, in both government and the academy have learned the important role of journalism. You all have outdone yourselves in the past year in terms of helping us understand the data when we weren't getting the data uh, from other sources. So um, I think that the journalism has really proven um, itself, particularly in, in this most recent period. And we have, you know, the shifts in Georgia, which somebody in Mississippi must be paying attention to. And uh, we, you know, we have a growing um, sense that people should not be deprived of health care uh, and uh, that we, we have to solve this as a, a nation. Uh, whether the people in Mississippi who've made it like you have to be so poor to even get uh, Medicaid, um, you know, will listen. Well, may, maybe it's time for them to be out of a job, frankly. Um, and uh, we need to pay attention to people being able to vote. Just to add to that, um, yes, Dr. Bassett, and that, um, so what what Lizzie's story has done. I can only speak to the peripheral natural disease space. Mm. Um, they have tried for decades to raise awareness on how poor circulation to your limbs called peripheral arterial disease leads to amputations. And uh, out of the two, almost 160,000 to 200,000 amputations that occur each year, diabetes, diabetics account for 65% of that population. Now, what this did is it did two things. One, it raised awareness on the disease, the underlying disease state, peripheral arterial disease, but it also did something else. We live in a fragmented um, I guess, fragmented industry when it comes to the number of physicians and the type of specialties that are involved in the care, the vascular care of these patients. Some are cardiologists, some are radiologists, some are vascular surgeons. What this story did is it led to not only other outlets such as, you know, Reader's Digest and Men's Health and all the, you know, major news organizations to want to interview, but also led to the stakeholders to learn that, you know what, you all have to come together and figure this out. And there is a lot of work being done as I speak with a lot of statements and policy statements and papers being published as to how we need to tackle this moving forward. But also on the policy front, we had been stagnated in terms of how to move this needle to affect change. And we had established the PAD caucus, which was basically bringing our policymakers to be aware of this amputation of that epidemic. But her story really led um, basically, the, the leading force behind this to say, listen, we need we need we need to push a bill, and the introduction of Amputation Reduction and Compassion Act that is being pushed right now is something that really would not 
have carried the steam that it got without Liz's story. So that's what a story can do. It can lead to not only raising awareness on a, such a prevalent and underreported and undertreated epidemic affecting 18 million Americans, but also 200 million worldwide. And one of the most expensive disease states that most Americans haven't heard of costing almost you know $200 billion, if you were to put the numbers together. And 80% of, at least 80 to 85% of these amputations could be prevented if treated upstream. Um, and that's where we all now, both Republicans, Democrats, right? We all, we all, we all see one thing, you know, independence. How do we save money? <laughs> and how we save money is by focusing on policy and working with our public health officials and working with reporters now, right? So this is disruptive in a way. Right, it's it's good. We call it, you know, it's I I see it as disruptive, as a way to tell a story, rather than as you said earlier, Nick. You said you know you're speaking to your audience, rather than me going to a conference and just talking about how I decrease amputation rate by 85 percent. Direct to consumer approach, sell it to the masses, let them be their voices, empower them, teach them what diabetes could do to them, and how it's had a generational scar. And they find that relatable, and hence why the response has just been great um, in terms of just how moved people have been by the story. And kudos to ProPublica and, and Lizzie for doing that for, for our campaign. You got to tell your editor the story, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Dr. Fakarade, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and just especially for thank your you. work on the front lines. Uh, and it is it is great to hear about the. Uh, mm -hmm. You know the the results that we hope are in the works um, from Lizzie's story, and that this will make a difference you know, with your patients. Uh, so, bravo! Well, um, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, Lizzie, and you guys, and Dr. Bassett. You guys are all hope dealers in my my view as well. So, thank you very much. We appreciate that. God bless. Um, Lizzie, mm -hmm. there's a question. Uh, it has come in from a Karen. Um, uh, Karen asks, uh, convincing people to share their personal stories is always a challenge, uh, and that persuading uh, African Americans who have historically been harmed in so many ways to share it is an extra challenge. Um, and I guess I just layer on top of that, you know, the, the ethical issue that you are asking people to bear their souls in ways that will help address the larger public health problem, but that may not benefit themselves. And in fact, they may you know, they may suffer a loss of privacy, they may uh, be stigmatized uh, in ways that don't advantage them, but will help many, many other people. So how, how do you negotiate that? Uh, how do you win that consent? How do you make sure it's informed consent? Uh, how, do you, how do you do that? Yeah, it's a really good question and a really important question. Um, I. I, I believe that I never convince someone to talk to me. If someone doesn't want to talk to me, that's fine. And I'm not going to ask them to. And that's because, or I'm not going to re-ask them to. And that's because I believe that these stories are really built on, on mutual trust and on an interest uh, on behalf of both people, right? So I tell people up front, like this story will not work unless this is something that you feel like is important to you to tell, right? I want you to feel as invested in this process as I am. And I have lost subjects that way, and I have gained trust of subjects that way. Um, and I prefer to come in being very clear that that's how I see this work. It doesn't mean that they have creative control, but it does mean that they are, are interested in letting me into their worlds and in allowing me to see what they have experienced um, and also letting me into their interior worlds and letting me understand how they've experienced these struggles, right? And that's what I'm looking for. I don't, I, I cannot tell a story without that. And I don't want to force anyone to do it. And so it is a long process of trust building. And so while, for example, I was in the Delta with Dr. Fakarede, I was also meeting with patients in their homes or in restaurants at a time when we could go to restaurants, um, taking walks with them, going with them to other doctor's appointments and talking with them about their lives. Um, anyone who wasn't interested, that was totally okay. Uh, and I had the privilege of meeting wonderful patients who felt not only that this was important to them, but who felt that it was empowering to speak out 
and to say, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my grandma, to my aunt, to my cousin? This isn't right. Um, and so for many people, it can be quite an empowering experience. We have one of the challenges is that we have a healthcare system that um, maximizes revenues to some folks in the healthcare system, um, but it doesn't maximize various healthcare metrics. And that's the issue that you explored uh, very, very powerfully in your story, tethered to a machine about. Um, uh, about the, the story of somebody and his quest for a new kidney. Um, can you share with us a little bit about that story? Yeah, after I finished the story on amputations, I turned my attention to kidney disease. And that was in part because academic researchers, medical researchers have documented the disparities in care at kind of every step of the process from diabetes to kidney disease, to seeing an expert, to being referred for a transplant evaluation, to getting on that wait list and to getting a transplant. And so I wanted to disentangle what I saw as this kind of complex layering effect of these disparities and to tell that story through one patient. And I spoke to dozens of patients actually at first because I didn't quite know how I would tell the story. And um, Jamarcus Cruz was one of those patients. And several weeks after we began talking, he was diagnosed with COVID-19 and very quickly hospitalized. And I was stunned uh, at the speed with which his health deteriorated. And I turned my attention to telling his story because I felt like it was mirroring the experiences of millions of people around the country who were watching loved ones and people they knew who had long been neglected by the healthcare system, right? then suffer the most extreme consequences of COVID-19. So Jamarcus had grown up in Centerville, Alabama, and he was born overweight. His mother had diabetes when she gave birth to him, which made him more predisposed to developing the condition. He was diagnosed with diabetes as a teenager, and he fought hard to bring his weight under control and to rid himself of that diagnosis. This was type two diabetes. And he lost 100 pounds, but he, he just could not shake that diagnosis. And as he aged out of Medicaid, it was very difficult for him to access the medications and the doctors that he needed to see to manage that diabetes. And diabetes is one of these conditions that is imminently manageable if you have the means, if you have the health insurance, if you have the access to the doctors and the specialists who you need to control that diabetes. Jamarcus had that sometimes, and other times he did not. Um, he graduated from college. He worked as a teller at a bank. And at the age of 30, he was diagnosed with kidney failure. The age of 30, it's extraordinarily young. Um, and he was placed on dialysis and he, um, he could no longer work a nine to five job. He ended up working in like dollar stores because they had more flexible schedules while he was on dialysis. And he was fighting to get a kidney transplant and despite his efforts, he was simply not getting the, um, the guidance that he needed to get on a transplant list. Um, at one point, the University of Alabama, which was the closest transplant center to him, had lowered their BMI limit so that he qualified. But in this story, I write about how no one in his dialysis center had even told him. And that's not the fault of an individual necessarily. It's a systemic problem, right? We have a dialysis system that is built to uh, fill seats. That's how they make money. It's not financially incentivized to move people into transplant. And so they haven't necessarily developed the systems necessary to move everyone equitably into a transplant. And that's what we saw with Jamarcus. Um, Dr. Bassett, there are clearly these longstanding racial inequities uh, in the healthcare system. I've heard the argument that uh, as white working class Americans have seen their life expectancy go down, that that has led to uh, greater empathy for um, those who need healthcare, including African-American patients. Mm -hmm. And that for example, in the case of addiction, you know, that as more whites have been wrestling with addiction, that we've gone from reframing uh, a conversation from junkies who should be tossed in jail mm -hmm. to people in need of treatment in ways that are hypocritical, 
that reflect a double standard, but they may actually oh, the right result thing. in yeah. better care yeah, yeah. <laughs> belatedly. Um, right. And so I wonder if you think that is you know, an opportunity to expand Medicaid, to exp to improve access for people with diabetes, to improve uh, renal care, to, uh, you know, and how, and I is, think, is it forward and doesn't it feel kind yeah. of, kind of- Well, in, uh, uh, in her opening remarks, the Dean quoted Heather McGee, who's written uh, The Sum of Us uh, and makes a really compelling case for how these uh, disadvantages that affect disproportionately uh, black people in the United States also numerically harm more white people. Um, so that we should begin to consider how, who would really benefit um, by expanding access to Medicaid at the least, um, taking steps to put in place genuine universal uh, access to health care. We still have millions of people in this country who, who have no health coverage. And I, I think that, you know, for me, it's a compelling argument, um, whether it can overcome uh, the many centuries of embrace of white racial solidarity is really what our challenge is. And, um, and, and maybe journalists can help us with that. It's a cultural <laughs> phenomenon. Um, that is also rooted in economic advantage. Um, obviously, if you're poor and white, you're far more likely to have some wealth than if you're poor and black. So it's not as though there's no difference. But I, I think that the argument that, um, that these divisions hurt all of us and the, the way in which racism has affected uh, willingness to support a social safety net has hurt white people as well as people of African descent is, is one that we all have to keep talking about because it's true and <laughs> it has the advantage of being true. Um, the, I mean, the, the steps to having a failing kidney, you know, are, is a long path, um, you know, beginning with who has access to healthy food, who has access to, you know, that's not too sugary, salty, caloric, uh, because that kind of food is much cheaper. Why is our food system structured this way? Who's benefiting from it? Who's paying? Uh, and then, you know, getting to when healthcare can make a difference in treating the high blood pressure and ma managing the diabetes. How do we figure out how to ensure that people have access to this healthcare? Clearly, from the point of view of the cost to the economy, uh, prevention makes sense. But in terms of the cost to the system, sadly, our healthcare delivery system makes money off illness. And that is still the way it is. Obviously, as a public health person, I, I think that that's not, that that's unwise. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Fucker wants to add something from the Mississippi Delta. Yes. Um, so um, I, I want to now, uh, you know, talk about how both stories actually meet in terms of Jamarcus's story, and I can pick, you know, the first story in our in our in our article as well. Um, Henry Dotson, um, when you look at policies that are in place as to screening for diabetes, but not only screen for diabetes, but those who we consider at risk for an for poor circulation or an amputation. One thing that our policymakers need to understand or those who are in the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, and I think they're coming around now with now urging for early screening in diabetics, uh, the age limit now being lowered. Um, they noticed that, yes, diabetes is actually one of the things that actually emanated from our poor dietary and, uh, and large obesity population, right, that we're seeing that it's now um, it's, it's now affecting our younger populations, but also we're seeing it affect our kidney patients early on. A case like Jamarcus, who if he had had access to quality care, it's not just access to care. And I, I want to be very cautious with the Medicaid expansion. Mississippi should have been one of the states that's the poorest state in the union to, to say, yes, we need Medicaid expansion for at least 500,000 uninsured patients. But you can have, as Dr. Bassett mentioned, all these for-profit hospital systems that actually profit off 
of patients who are sicker and payers who sometimes also are blinded to the fact that prevention is what we need to focus on. And so if we screen these patients early on for diabetes, they don't progress to seeing a Dr. Fakirita in his office for limb salvage. They don't progress to ending up being on a kidney machine where a social worker who doesn't understand your social determinants of the fact that you live far away and cannot have that transportation that is Medicaid dependent, that usually takes four hours for a one-way trip to get you to your dialysis site, that if you miss, you are then labeled as a non-compliant patient and taken off the transplant list. And so now we're, we're seeing how it's all connected as to how you're going from adding your social determinants to how it affects your access to quality. And if you put that in a pot, you see why we're having younger patients who are ending up on dialysis machines or ending up losing their limbs and why COVID took advantage of that patient population. If you look at the deaths from COVID, you're looking at that same patient population who are diabetics, kidney patients, and patients who have high blood pressure. It's all intertwined. All COVID did was blinded that health disparity. And this is where reporters actually connect the dots better than physicians. <laughs> Lizzie, um, these stories are so important. We've seen that they make a difference. And yet, uh, ProPublica lost money on your story. If you spent a month reporting that, you know, it, uh, it, it or the New Yorker lost money. At the Times, the same thing. And what we need to do is get these stories on television where there is a broader audience. And yet the reason executive producers don't send camera crews to do that story is um, because viewers will switch the channel. So you're working for an organization that uses foundation money. Is that a direction for uh, covering public health? And should we try to get more public support uh, for news organizations, especially television, for-profit television agent organizations to cover public health? I certainly think so. I mean, I, I do, it does feel like ProPublica is moving in a direction that much of the news industry will begin to move in as well with public money, but I don't know for sure. Um, I agree with you though, Nick, that people don't read as much as I wish they did. Um, and that it's hard to reach a wide audience with a, a 7,000 word story. Um, people don't have time to read like that anymore. Uh, so I, I agree that it's important to get to get this stuff on television, to get it on podcasts, to get it on the radio, to get it in films. I mean, I, in my ideal world, this is also the subject of a fiction film. You know, I, I do think it has that kind of power. And so it's something that we talk about at ProPublica and try to encourage from an early stage. We did end up getting Dr. Fakarady on national news um, and we did speak about it, but you know, a three minute clip, you can only do so much. And so part of me actually also wonders about, uh, yeah, strangely fiction films that are based on real life events is, is one way to reach an enormous audience. Um, we have a, uh... Uh, a, que a final question from uh, the former president of your alma mater, uh, mm -hmm. Lizzie, Dr. Shirley Tilgman. Hi, Lizzie. You've written so compellingly and movingly about the many ways in which Americans of color have been disadvantaged in their access to and their treatment by the medical establishment. I'm curious to know how you read the current level of intensity in the national discourse around anti-racism. Is this a true inflection point that signals a meaningful change or will the energy of this moment dissipate over time as happened after the civil rights movement in the 1970s? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think as a journalist, uh, my job is often to document the, the problems that I've seen over time. And so I don't put too much faith into my predictive abilities for the future, but I will say that um, I do think that there has been change and there will be change. One of the issues I wrote about in the story about Jamarcus was a clinical algorithm called EGFR that uses a race-based variable to determine your kidney function. And so if you're black, you have one variable. And if you are literally any other race, you have another variable. And it's based on very shaky, outdated science. Um, and it is this assumption that black bodies are different from every other body. And that is an assumption that has infiltrated medicine for centuries and it was used to rationalize slavery and it still exists in our clinical decision making today. Mm -hmm. And over the past year, we have seen a widespread um, 
student-led movement really mm -hmm. to abolish that race-based clinical algorithm um, and to figure out a way to be um, measuring kidney function that doesn't adjust for race when there's very, very little support um, scientifically for that decision. So that's one area in which we have seen an advancement. It is a small area in a much larger discussion about social determinants of health and how we level the playing field much earlier on, much further upstream. Stream. It is still an advancement. I think the other thing though that I would say is that with every advancement um, usually comes a backlash. And that's not something that I think the American education system does a great job of, of teaching. Um, and it's something that I try to look at in my work often. And so if we are to see any kind of true advancement um, through the anti-racism movement of today, I think it also behooves us to be thinking about how do we protect people who will inevitably feel the consequences of a backlash that is sure to come. Well, thank you all so much. We are turning into pumpkins, but I want to uh, thank Dr. Bakarede, Dr. Bassett, and and Lizzie. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you for your work. Uh, I know you have a big piece about daycare coming up, and we're eager to to see that. Uh, thank you to the uh, Chan School of Public Health and to Dean Williams. And uh, there will be a. Um, a school signature event on April 26th at 1 p.m. with Dr. Fauci. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. And with that, um, thank you all. Thanks to all who are watching. And together, we can maybe help address some of these inequities that Lizzie has highlighted. Thank you all. <laughs>